and this measurement is actually the measurement of the cylinder pressure uh, inside the cylinder inside the cylinder of an engine uh, how the cylinder pressure varies with respect to crank position and uh, what are the precautions we have to take when we make such measurements and what are the sources of errors and how we can uh, look at combustion through cylinder pressure is what we are going to see today so this is not about engines but about measurements in engines so if you look at i'll briefly look at uh, general measurements in engines and then we'll go on in particular to cylinder pressure if you look at measurement uh, that we normally do in laboratories we do measurements for looking at the performance of the engine like the speed the torque then the emissions like hcco and nox smoke particulates then we also look at uh, at a next level at an advanced level we look at combustion and uh, when we look at combustion we look at combustion through cylinder pressure time data and uh, cylinder pressure time data can give us information on combustion for example we look at imep cyclic variations in combustion the way combustion itself is occurring that is heat release rates and all this can be seen through cylinder pressure we also look at combustion through other mechanisms like uh, the ionization probe data flame photographs fuel injection pressures manifold pressure and things like that then we may also want to measure simultaneously the valve timing injection timing and also other uh, other parameters like different temperatures and so on from cylinder pressure we also try to estimate knock and knock is estimated through cylinder pressure variations at a very high frequency we call this pressure oscillations or even sometimes knock is estimated through vibrations which occur inside on the cylinder cylinder itself we may also want to do sampling of the gases from within the cylinder so that we can look at emissions as a function of space and time if it's a two stroke engine we can even look at scavenging efficiency through that we may also go one step higher uh, into looking at the physics and looking at what really happens inside so that it can help us validate our simulation models or build better models of the combustion process and for that we may want to go to flow field measurements cylinder flow field that is looking at the flow inside the cylinder and uh, for this we would look at the mean velocity the turbulence intensity and so on so there are different levels of measurements to be done and we may also do measurements which are basically aimed at control and when we look at measurements aimed at control uh, for example we may want to control a dynamometer we may want to control a um, fuel injection system or we may want to control a diesel engine speed or we may want to control the entire engine in uh, for example if it is a spark ignition engine we may want to control the uh, spark timing the fuel injection quantity fuel injection timing and even if it's turbo charge it turbo charge so many things so in all these cases we end up in doing lots of measurements and measurements could be of different levels different accuracies different kinds of sensors with different kinds of sensors and so on but we are today going to focus more on cylinder pressure so if you look at engine research you could have sensors which can be as as varied as this on the left hand side on uh, here we see uh, what is called as a single cylinder research engine and it has it uh, it is an engine where you can practically change almost any parameter you want like the valve timing the fuel injection parameters the spark time parameters the coolant temperature lube oil temperature all fuel injection system system related parameters turbocharger related parameters and so on and uh, the same engine could even have optical access like what you see here you can pass a laser through this uh, you can pass a laser through the uh, through a transparent portion of the engine and then see it you see the transparent portion of the cylinder barrel here with the valves and all that but that that portion is not transparent so you can look at the flow inside through this you can also look at cylinder pressure using different kinds of cylinder pressure probes that are shown here all these different kinds of probes which are put directly on the cylinder head and you have a lot of a host of uh, other uh, amplifiers and things like that which go along with cylinder pressure uh, transducers then you can look at knocking by looking at vibration on the engine by putting a vibration transducer you may have emission analyzers to analyze almost uh, i mean all of the important emission uh, emissions that come out of the engine so there are several uh, things that one would like to look at while making a measurement on an engine and a typical experimental setup on an engine a research setup could look like this where almost always when you do very fundamental research you will have a, a single cylinder engine coupled to a loading device which could motor or load the engine at any speed you want you may have an emission measurement you may have combustion measurement through a computer where you take the cylinder pressure data and you may have air flow measurements fuel flow measurements the measurements of the crankshaft position and so on so uh, with all this then you need to take all this data to a computer 
then you need to uh, reject what is not wanted like filtering data then you need to see whether it's accurate you need to calibrate and then finally you need to do compute computations on that to arrive at whatever you want to see now when it particularly comes to cylinder pressure which is the focus of today's lecture we use what are called as piezoelectric pressure transducers the piezoelectric pressure transducers are used for the main pressure in the cylinder which means that this is the heart of the entire measuring chain and the piezoelectric pressure transducer is mounted on the cylinder head and it gives you what is called as a charge output it gives you what is called as a charge output i don't know something is changing just one minute it gives you a charge output and this charge output has to be converted to a voltage using a charge amplifier and this charge amplifier uh, accepts charge it's basically a, a capacitor which gets charged because of the charge there is an voltage and then this voltage is amplified and uh, the cylinder pressure transducer the piezoelectric transducer has a problem which we'll discuss very soon it can give only changes in pressure and and not the actual value of the pressure so we need to make some calculations to get the actual value and we call this method of getting the actual value from the uh, from the change in pressure as referencing then you may need a high speed data acquisition system to go along with cylinder pressure measurement and you may want to measure the manifold pressure also along with cylinder pressure now if you look at uh, the manifold pressure see and when i say manifold pressure uh, it is the intake manifold and uh, the manifold pressure transducer is almost always a piezo resistive transducer why it is a piezo resistive transducer we'll see later and this piezo resistive transducer basically needs its own bridge amplifier which is called a carrier frequency amplifier then it has modulators and demodulators and again this signal also goes to a fast data acquisition system it's sim and it is manifold pressure is measured simultaneously with cylinder pressure then uh, if we have to measure pressure as a function of crank angle that means pressure has to be expressed as a function of theta and uh, for measure linking pressure and crank angle you need to have what is called as a crank angle encoder and uh, these encoders are basically optical position encoders or the optical position detectors and they give you pulses at exact crank positions which we call as ttl pulses and uh, the pulse comes depending on the position of the crankshaft and the frequency at which the pulse will come will depend on the speed at which the engine is actually running so pulses come at various frequencies and these could be used to trigger when a measurement has to be made so we call it trigger pulses for data acquisition they could also be used as timing pulses for initiating certain events like fuel injection and things like that so we'll look at these things as we proceed now coming to engine cylinder pressure as such here you see uh, an engine with uh, a combustion occurring inside the engine and this combustion basically uh, and this combustion basically uh, is seen through cylinder pressure which we see here and uh, what we also see here is that the cylinder pressure can be affected by various things uh, for example the cylinder pressure could be affected by the combustion cylinder pressure could be affected by volume changes cylinder pressure could be affected by heat transfer and also by leakages so you may want to put a pressure transducer here and here and get the value of the cylinder pressure and have a look at it but then what you see would not only be the influence of combustion but it will also be the influence of several other parameters like uh, heat transfer volume changes leakages etc and if you want to look at combustion from cylinder pressure you have to remove all these effects and these effects are removed through computations so you need to have a computation model through which you can eliminate the influence of volume influence of heat transfer and influence of leakage and arrive at combustion through cylinder pressure so it is not only measurement it also is analysis so that's what we are going to see there are various levels at which you can analyze it depending on the accuracies that you want and the speed at which you want to uh, get those results basically the cylinder pressure is the one which changes the torque output of the engine and the speed of the engine in turn but its variation uh, actually 
uh, embeds in it several influences and so it's a very very useful information we'll call it like the as the ecg of the engine so no engine research is done without measurement of cylinder pressure and cylinder pressure gives you actual combustion values when the engine is really running under under real loads so it is the i would say the best possible way of looking at combustion something is happening <laughs> i'll just shut it down and okay then why measure cylinder pressure now what can you get actually from cylinder pressure first of all from cylinder pressure you can get imep we know that the p theta diagram can be converted to the pv diagram p theta can be converted to pv and integral pdv will give you the work of the cycle so from the work of the cycle you can get imep so the estimation of imep of the engine is best done through cylinder pressure and there is no better method of getting imep other than from cylinder pressure you can get imep from the uh, bmep and then from friction losses but they are all approximate so uh, so for imep and even for estimating friction losses cylinder pressure becomes very important now we may also want to study the influence of pumping losses pumping losses are losses which occur when when the engine takes uh, uh, air into the cylinder or when the engine pushes the exhaust out of the cylinder and pumping losses can also be looked at only from cylinder pressure now cylinder pressure uh, variation during the suction and exhaust strokes can give us what work we do during the suction and exhaust strokes or the pumping losses i already told that the burning rates or the combustion within the cylinder can also be obtained through cylinder pressure and uh, then and probably uh, this is the best way of getting the burning rates we can also get the uh, get an estimate of the gas pressures and temperatures and uh, from the cylinder pressure mm, get an estimate of the gas temperatures and pressures from cylinder pressure and uh, this uh, would mean that uh, you can do use these values for design and knock identification or knock detection is best done from cylinder pressure uh, when the engine knocks the you get a noise and it is because the pressure in the cylinder is rapidly fluctuating and uh, you you can look at noise and then find find engine knock or you can look at vibrations and then find knock but the source is actually from cylinder pressure so if you look at cylinder pressure and find engine knock that will be the best way of finding engine knock and so quantify engine knock we use cylinder pressure calculations of torque fluctuations uh, you, you can see here in this figure you can see this is the fired pressure that is the pressure when the engine is running and this is the pressure when the engine is motored that is when the engine is simply cranked and there is no fuel and no spark so you can see that this is the compression portion till the compression portion you find that both the curves are matching that is with combustion without combustion there is no change the moment you have combustion because of the spark you find that the curve deviates and the this is the combustion this is the pressure during combustion there is a pressure during expansion this is pressure when the exhaust valve is opening so you find that there is a deviation between the motor pressure and the fired pressure when when combustion occurs and so from that only you can estimate your uh, combustion but then you can also see this pressure curve can be converted to a torque curve because pressure acting on the piston multiplied by area will give you the force on the piston and then with the angular relative the connecting rod and the crankshaft you can work out the torque on the crankshaft so the instantaneous torque on the engine is actually fluctuating the torque on the shaft is actually fluctuating this shows the torque when the engine is fired and this shows the torque shows the torque when the engine is motored so this torque fluctuation comes out through the crankshaft and the torque fluctuation goes to the gearbox if you have a gearbox coupled to it so it affects the gearing and things like that so if you want to design the gear train even then you may want to know how the torque is fluctuating and that can also be got from cylinder pressure so estimation of torque fluctuations estimation of engine roughness gas forces all these can be done through cylinder pressure you can also look at 
how how stable the engine is the study of cyclic variations for example one cycle is one cycle combustion is not like the next cycle's combustion in engine because there are cycle to cycle variations and that also can be studied you can also study man manifold wave action and many such subtle effects so cylinder pressure gives you a whole wealth of data nice whole wealth of data engine now how do we really measure what do we really how do we really make a measurement what sort of a measuring system do we need basically we need a cylinder pressure transducer which will have a very high natural frequency that is a transducer must have a very high natural frequency that means it should respond to very very fast fluctuations in cylinder pressure the natural frequency that we want uh, for the transducer will sometimes be greater than 100 kilohertz and we need also a sensor which can withstand high temperatures because it's going to be directly on the cylinder head and be exposed to the combustion gases it should be able to withstand it should be able to take high pressures because the pressure can vary from ambient pressure to something like in modern engines diesel turbocharged diesel engines they expect pressures of 225 bar so nearly ambient or 4 3 to 5 bar to about 225 bar would be the pressure changes it should be able to do that it should withstand high thermal shock because of when combustion occurs the temperature suddenly go up and again when intake occurs the temperature suddenly go down so it will be every time cycle within the combustion chamber so it should be able to withstand thermal shock it should yet be very sensitive that means for a small change in pressure it will give you a very high change in output and it should be extremely linear and it should also be extremely accurate these are what we expect from a cylinder pressure transducer and if you can see these are what you would expect from any transducer but the level at which you expect all this from a cylinder pressure transducer is extremely high that makes the transducer very very expensive now the only transducer that can do all this is the piezoelectric transducer the piezoelectric effect is known to us i just repeat it there are certain crystals uh, which when stressed and deformed produce Uh, charge that means they don't produce a charge you find that one side of the crystal becomes positively charged the other face of the crystal becomes negatively charged so there is a shift and this charge is proportional to the stress that you apply on the crystal or the deformation of the crystal so you could use longitudinal effects transverse effects or shear effects to produce this stress and that stress will appear as a uh, charge on the opposite faces of the crystal and uh, this charge will then be calibrated to give you the stress or the and the stress will be calibrated to give you the pressure so basically the cylinder pressure transducer this is a old transducer which i'm showing modern transducers work on the same principle but in construction they might have changed significantly nevertheless this tells you how the transducer actually works uh, i have just taken transducers from different uh, uh, systems and you see here that basically you have a piezoelectric crystal and this crystal has two phases one is this side and the other one is the other side and on this side you have Uh, contact the contact could even be made out of gold and so you look at this charges on both sides of the crystal and the output is taken through this pin and at the bottom you have a diaphragm which is shown here and you apply a pressure on the diaphragm and the diaphragm deforms and when the diaphragm deforms the crystal is stressed and then you get an output and this this whole transducer the entire diameter of the transducer modern transducer is even smaller than less than 5 mm it is even sometimes around 3 mm that's that sort of the size of the transducer and that you directly plug on to your cylinder head go into the head and this side is actually exposed to the the flame it is actually on the combustion gases so you can imagine at what temperatures it will be exposed and what pressures it will be exposed and again suddenly cooled second so suddenly heated every time so this is the stress on the cylinder pressure transducer now the cylinder pressure transducer can be subjected to severe uh, environmental effects because of the way in which it is being used the gas temperature has can go to as high a value as 2000 degrees celsius during combustion of course the transducer's temperature may not go to 2000 but it is touching this gas which is at 2000 degrees celsius the the uh, transducer's temperature may even reach about 500 degrees celsius on an So, I mean, sometimes so the transducer is fluctuating in its temperature and uh, you have acceleration and vibration on the transducer depending on 
uh, how the engine is running and the acceleration values could be very high. You could also have distortions on the transducer because the diaphragm of the transducer which is exposed to hot gases may itself not have a uniform temperature so the diaphragm can distort because of thermal gradients on the structure and it can also deform because of the deformations on the structure of the transducer. So this can happen. You can have thermal shock within every cycle the temperature changes. So it's subjected to a very, very severe environment and the worst possible environment. Hey, apart from all this, you also have corrosion because you have hot gases and many intermediate chemical species. You use different kinds of fuels. So all this can happen. So here what you see uh, is uh, a typical cylinder pressure measuring uh, system. And uh, uh, you see a single cylinder engine uh, and coupled to a dynamometer on this side. The dynamometer is here. And uh, basically we focus on the important aspects or sensors used for cylinder pressure measurement. You have the cylinder pressure sensor here, which is shown, shown, shown here. You have the piezoelectric cylinder pressure transducer. The output of the piezoelectric transducer from the cable is taken to a charge amplifier, which you see here. Then from the charge amplifier, it goes to a data acquisition system. Along with the cylinder pressure transducer, as I told sometime back, you also need to measure the manifold pressure. So this is a manifold pressure transducer, which is piezo-resistive, as I have shown here. From the piezo-resistive transducer, you again take a signal through an amplifier to the data acquisition system. Pressures have to be measured in relation to crank angle. So you also have a crank angle encoder, which you see here. And the crank angle encoder's output is also taken to the data acquisition system. So all the three outputs are taken to the data acquisition system and are being recorded by the data acquisition system. Now, I will first go to the crank position determination. There are many ways in which you could determine the crank position. This is a typical angle encoder, which could be used for crank position measurements. And this angle encoder is basically attached to the camshaft or the crankshaft of the engine. And the angle encoder gives what are called as angle pulses at, let us say, 1 degree or 0 0.5 degree or 0 0.1 degree or so on. It gives you regular pulses. That means the duration of this one full cycle of a pulse may correspond to some angle theta. And theta could be any of these. So it gives you regular pulses. Apart from that, you have what is called as a once in every revolution pulse, which also comes. And we call this, we may align this pulse with top dead center. We may align it with any angle. And we call this the, we call, we could call this the reset pulse. And we could call this the trigger pulse. So the angle pulse is called the trigger pulse. And once per revolution pulse could be called the reset pulse. And the pulses could be of different forms. They could be raising when a particular angle comes. They could be falling when a particular angle comes. They could be of a particular width, all sorts of things. And these, for these things, you should look at the particular angle encoders manual and see how that angle encoder works. But definitely, you will at least have two signals. One would be the angle signal at some regular angular intervals. And another one would be a reset signal coming once in every revolution. And you will have more than this actually coming from any angle encoder. And you should infer this. From here, you should get the crank positions. Now, schematically, this is how it is. The piezoelectric transducer going to the charge amplifier and going to the data acquisition system. The piezo-resistive transducer also going to the data acquisition, which is not shown here, plus the crank angle encoder also going to the data acquisition system. Now, uh, great care has to be actually I mean, ex I mean, exercised in mounting the transducer. One may think that it is a transducer just mounted and then it should work, but it's not so. We should follow the tightening procedures given by the transducer manufacturer because the transducer is too small. And uh, over tightening may physically damage it, or over tightening may stress the transducer, and the transducer will no longer be linear. It will be, it may become non-linear, or it may not give you the correct accuracy. So mounting the transducer without residual strains is very important. So we have to follow what the manufacturer of the transducer says. We also see, need to see that it is protected from high temperatures and thermal shock. For example, if we can, we should use a water cool transducer, a transducer which has internal water cooling. But nowadays, it is, this is not very common. And we should not place the transducer directly on a place where we expect a fuel spray to come and where we expect very high temperatures after combustion. So do not place the transducer directly on the flame. 
and if you have to place the transducer directly on the flame and there is no option and the transducer gets disturbed because of that flame maybe you need to have a protection you need to have a protective shield use a thermal shield and use a passage or things like that and protect the transducer so uh, and then you have to regularly calibrate the transducer use a proper time constant for the charge amplifier check for drifts which i'll see tell you very soon and properly reference the signals so these are things which we should be looking at now mm, i told you sometime back that a piezoelectric transducer will only give you changes in pressure and it won't give you the actual pressure this is one of the main problems of the piezoelectric transducer and uh, there is another problem also which we which we uh, which we call as drift and i'm going to explain to you both these problems and how you can sort of uh, identify these problems and overcome these problems particularly drift uh, actually referencing is not a problem it is something which you have to handle because it is the nature of the transducer now drift is uh, something which you have in a piezoelectric transducer drift is there in many instruments it's a very normal term in instrumentation you have what is called as short term drift and long term drift in a piezoelectric transducer now short term drift is drift which is because of temperature effects which in the cycle that is i told you sometime back the transducer could be inside the cylinder and there'll be when during when there is combustion temperature changes and because of the change in temperature during combustion there could be changes which occur in the transducer and this is called the short term drift so short term drift is due to deformations of the diaphragm because of temperature gradients and temperature changes within a cycle point to notice it is within a cycle and it is very significant at low speeds as the cycle time is longer so you tend to see it and it is very very difficult to solve this problem only thing you can do is mount the transducer in a point where you may not have such changes and cool the transducer properly thermally isolate the transducer it is very difficult to 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 uh, nullify this effect once it happens it's not possible to remove this effect because you cannot predict how much it is so one has to carefully mount the transducer the next one is the long term drift long term drift is drift that is i just put the transducer on the engine and i have not done anything to the engine and i see that the signal of, from the transducer is continuously changing without any input the output is changing this is due to it could be because of mean temperature changes of the transducer during load change or it could be caused to some other thermal stresses on the diaphragm and it it is generally during transient conditions so you can see that there could also be long term drift or drift due to charge leakage that is you i told you that this piezoelectric transducer is basically a uh, crystal you compress the crystal and you have charge so this crystal is like a capacitor so you have, you have compress the crystal the crystal has produced some charge and this charge is appearing on the face of the crystal so it is like a capacitor now a capacitor can get discharged internally it can also get discharged externally because of wires that you connect and all the resistances that you have or the low resistance you have outside so same thing happens even in a piezoelectric crystal you apply a pressure and then you read the output this output keeps on changing even though the pressure is not changing it is because the output is getting gradually uh, what do you say the charge is getting nullified so this is one of the most common problems and the main reason is insufficient insulation resistance it is not a mistake of the transducer because the transducer would have been made properly it's a mistake of the wires and connections that we have if the wires and connections that we have are dirty cable ends connections wires are dirty then you find that the insulation resistance comes down then charge gets leaked within the wire itself and the only way to improve it is to clean and heat the wire clean and heat the transducer it's only a, it's only a problem of cleanliness that's all and maintaining the transducer with a very high resistance so but this is a very very common problem so when we make measurements using a cylinder pressure transducer before we actually rely on the measurement we should see whether there is drift and if there is no drift only we should proceed further and drift will be indicated by a change in output even when there is no change in input it will be continuously changing so we need to take it to a oscilloscope and see the signal when the engine is not running then how to mount the transducer the transducer has to be mounted flush on the cylinder wall that means if this is the engine the transducer has to be mounted like this so let us say this is the this is the piston 
and this is the cylinder head. And this is the piston. The transducer may be mounted directly on the cylinder head so that it is flush with the cylinder head wall. So it is all it is almost forming a part of the cylinder head wall, and the gas pressure which acts on the cylinder head will also act on the transducer. So this will be the transducer. So this is the best way of mounting, but sometimes this, it may not be possible to mount like this. You may want to mount the transducer here, and uh, you the cylinder head may be like this, so thick, and you may want to have a small passage connecting the transducer and the cylinder head, and this we call as a passage mounted. Then this passage length should be as small as possible. You should have a very small length for the passage, and better to avoid a passage. And the transducer should not be located in regions where there is squish. Uh, for example, in this in this engine, this is a squished region, so it is good to avoid the transducer being mounted here. We should not mount it here because in the squished region there will be intense flows into and out of the squished region. So this may not give you the right pressure. So squished region you should not mount. You should not mount it on the combustion chamber where knocking is occur occurring, or near a place where fuel spray will directly come and hit it. So when the fuel spray hits it, the transducer will be cooled, and then when combustion occurs, it will become very hot there. So you should not do all that. So one, if you avoid all this, then you can avoid most of the problems with drifting, and the transducer must not be over tightened. It looks like these are uh, some very very what do you say stringent precautions that we have to take. But yes, we do have to take because the cylinder pressure transducer is so sensitive, and uh, it is so expensive also. Then the two problems which I was telling, uh, out of that one of the problems is given here, the problem of referencing. This is the first problem. The second problem I have not told so far, and this is called the problem of facing. So now we have gone out of the transducer. Those are all things which were related to how the transducer should be used. Now it is related to how the signal from the transducer should be used. So even though you have the best possible transducer. Best possible mounting practice, no drift, etc. You will still have these two problems. So this is a problem which any measuring person who measures cylinder pressure will experience. And uh, these two problems have to be corrected. And how well you do it will finally reflect the reflect get reflected on the accuracy. Now, if you look at the two problems, one is called referencing, and the other one is called facing. Now, I look at this separately. Referencing means that the piezoelectric transducer, I told you some time back, can give you a signal, but this signal has no reference. What do I mean by that? Let us say I have a, this is time, and this is voltage. I have a signal which is like this. This is not a pressure signal; it's some arbitrary signal, and I have a voltage change of three volts here between them. When I say I don't have a reference. I only know that between this point and this point A and B, the delta V is three volts. But I do not know whether A is five volts and B is two volts, or A is four volts and B is one volt. I only know that between A and B there is a difference of three volts. So this kind of a measurement is measurement where you have only the relative changes. You do not know the absolute value. A uh, V A could have been five volts. B V B could have been three volts, or it could have been four volts and one volt. Sorry, one volt. Is it fluctuating voltage? The fluctuation in voltage is correct, but the actual voltage you don't know. So this is what we call as relative measurement. The cylinder pressure transducer gives like this for pressure. It can tell you from minimum to maximum what is the pressure change, but it cannot tell you the pressure at any point. That is because it of the nature of the transducer. The transducer can give you a voltage, any voltage, when the pressure is not when uh, at when you turn on the transducer, and thereafter the change in voltage will measure the pressure change in pressure. But when you turn on the old transducer, whatever is the voltage is the voltage. It is not a mistake of the transducer. That's how it works. So you get only changes in pressure, and from changes in pressure you have to get the pressure. That means at some let us say I know the I know the voltage here, I know the voltage everywhere. Suppose I know that V B is one volt. I know automatically that V A is. I know automatically that V A is uh, 
uh, is 4 volts. So if I know VB, I can get VA. So it is how do I know VB is a question. So so VB, when you make a measurement of cylinder pressure, you do not know any voltage, any 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 pressure. So you have to estimate one pressure, and every other pressure can be got. I need I want to uh, underline the word estimate here. You have to only going to estimate. That means it is really not correct. You are going to assign some pressure somewhere, and from there you will get every other pressure. So it is it depends on the user's experience and the and the method he is going to use and his knowledge with which you can assign the right pressure to the right point. So so pressure measurement also depends on how well you do the measurement. It's not simply that you plug and you get. Plug and you will get. There are many ways of doing it, but still, if you want extreme accuracy, then the involvement of the user is very important in cylinder pressure measurement. Sorry. With experience, you can do better measurements. I won't say without experience you cannot do. You can do because there is a lot of software which can help you and all that. But with experience, it can definitely be better. That's what I want to say. So how do we do it? We'll just see it very soon. This is one one aspect. The second aspect is proper facing of the signal. I have pressure. Now any any anything is coming as a function of time. So I'll, I'll get pressure as a function of time from the transducer. I will also have theta as a function of time. because angle encoder is giving me theta as a function of time pressure as a function of time but i want pressure as a function of theta i have to write link the right pressure with the right theta so i should know that when my angle when my theta is coming and pressure is coming i should know what pressure is coming at what theta this problem is called facing if i assign a wrong theta to my pressure then everything is wrong i'll be continuously making mistakes so how you correct this is also very important that is called facing the problem may look very simple but uh, it is complex actually suppose i have an angle encoder and i have not fixed it exactly at top dead center then i continuously get an error what i am thinking as top dead center is never top dead center so every angle is wrong so this is uh, this is uh, this is a this is an error so pressure signals have to be associated with the correct angle all instruments make measurements only at time not in crank position so hence methods have to be devised to counter this problem so you need to link them measurement of time and measurement of crank position so crank position has to be properly aligned uh, fine hmm. aside now we will go back to both the problems first we'll go to the first problem which is called referencing how we solve this problem there are many methods i'm not going to go through every method i'll just give you an indication of how this can be done others you can always read up or you can also ask me now one of the ways uh, as i just now told you uh, i'll again draw this and show you this is pressure this is time i'll call this is a, a pseudo pressure this is not the correct pressure simply i got a pressure value from the synthesis and i got it like this now and when i when i check this i'm saying i'm when i take this point it is coming as phi bar i know that it is at this point if i know properly it has to be only one bar and it should not be phi bar let us say i know it already then what i will do is i'll shift this curve down everywhere by 4 bar so this point will become one bar and every other point will be proper so this method of shifting this is called as referencing which means that somewhere in the pressure curve i should know the pressure and how do i measure that how do i know the pressure when i am not when i am myself measuring the pressure i do not know the pressure so i have to only assign a pressure so how do i assign a pressure is what i have listed here one of the methods is to assume that the mean intake manifold pressure when the engine is running in the intake manifold this is the intake manifold the pressure in the intake manifold is equal to the pressure in the cylinder when the piston is at bottom dead center of suction imagine when the piston has gone from tdc to bdc and gone to the bottom dead center end of the suction process and at the end of the suction process intake valve is open because intake valve closes after bdc so intake valve is open piston is stopped and then you are making an assumption that the pressure in the cylinder is the same as pressure in the manifold this may not be a completely correct assumption but it is a reasonably close assumption valve is open piston is stopped so cylinder pressure is equal to manifold pressure because the valve is communicating between them so this is one way so then what you do is on your pressure curve go and search where intake bdc has come 
at that point you see whatever was the pressure. If it was 5 bar and you know intake manifold pressure is 1 bar, subtract 4 bar from every point in the cycle. Then your entire curve shifts down and you get the right pressure. This is how you do referencing. So one way is to assume that the mean intake manifold pressure is cylinder pressure at BDC or the mean exhaust manifold pressure is equal to the cylinder pressure at TDC. Because when at TDC at the end of the exhaust stroke, exhaust valve is open, piston is also stopped. That's another assumption. There are many other methods of measuring instantaneous manifold pressure, instantaneous exhaust manifold pressure and so on. We will not go into it because of lack of time. But these are all available in literature. But you should, uh, I think one should understand why we are doing referencing. And one should understand that we cannot avoid referencing because the transducer works like that. And even if you use some sophisticated software and you are not doing referencing, we should know that internally referencing is happening. That software is doing it some way. And if you do not know how it is doing, we may not know whether it is the right method of doing for your engine. So we should also know how it is doing. So the next problem, I, and the referencing I am showing graphically here. Uh, see, this is the intake pressure. What I am trying, and this is the manifold pressure. I know that the manifold pressure is equal to the cylinder pressure at BDC, and that is the error which I showed here. And this error I am going to correct and make it zero. So what I am actually doing is shifting this to like this. I am going to shift the pressure curve, like what is shown at the bottom, down, down, and make it match with the intake manifold pressure. And once you make it match with the intake manifold pressure, then the entire pressure curve is proper. Now whatever you pressure readings you get on the y-axis is are okay. But the assumption is that this pressure is equal to manifold pressure. So now you are separately measuring the, so this also has to be measured by you. Separately we will measure that and put that value on that pressure. That is why we sometimes use a piezo-resistive transducer to measure in the manifold and put that value on the piezoelectric at that point. But one may ask why not put the piezo-resistive itself on the cylinder head? But piezo-resistive cannot withstand such temperatures. The only known transducer today for measuring cylinder pressure is piezoelectric. And that has been there around for at least, I would say, maybe 50 years. And nothing to replace. It has improved tremendously, but I don't think it has been replaced. So I hope uh, this point is clear. There are many other me methods, uh, like referencing based on polytropic index. I'm not going to, going to go through that. It takes time. So referencing based on polytropic index, two-point method, three-point method, thermodynamic referencing, all these are done by software. And so if you even buy a very sophisticated software like uh, some companies sell, like AVL, Kistler, there are uh, national instruments, all these people sell this software. But you should know really what is happening inside, how they are doing it. It will be given in the manual. Now, I have not still talked about facing. I told you facing is assigning the correct crank angle. I'll tell you how it is done later. But let us now uh, recollect that the errors that you can have are referencing errors, short-term and long-term drift errors, inherent electro electromagnetic noise or other noise that can come into the signal, then sensitivity errors. That is, you have assigned some wrong sensitivities. The, engine, uh, the instrument is actually has a different sensitivity. Passage effects and then systematic errors. So all these errors would, could come and we should be able to eliminate them. But some of the errors you can see and see the result and then find out that this error is there. And that's what I want to bring to your notice. Now here, see the best way to look at cylinder pressure is by looking at the motored pressure, not the fired pressure. You should take the pressure from the engine and the engine is not fired. You motor the engine that is crank it with an electric motor and then measure the pressure and then see where, and then check the pressure for its correctness. When the engine is fired, the pressure is disturbed by combustion and then it is very difficult to say whether it is correct or wrong. When the engine is motored, you know how the pressure should be. So from there you can find out whether the pressure is right or wrong. So motored pressure is very, very important. And from the motored pressure, you draw what is called as a log P, log V curve, motored curve. That is you take P versus theta and from here you put L and P, L and V and plot log P versus log V data. And then this log P versus log V data, you plot like this 
during the compression process. It is a polytropic process. Compression process is PV power n equals constant. Expansion process also after combustion is PV power. You can approximate it by PV power n equals constant. Of course, this will be n1, this will be n2, some other n. Now, if you have a process which is PV power n equals constant, if you draw the log p log v curve, it will be a straight line. And n would indicate, n would be related to the slope. So, if I draw the log p log v curve and I get absolute in straight lines, as you can see here, then you find that the pressure diagram is properly faced in, properly done. If it is not coming first of all like this, then you know something is wrong. From the diagram, you may be able to estimate what is wrong. You may not be able to estimate how much it is wrong, but what is wrong you can find out. For example, if I make an error in facing, I wrongly assign top dead center, you can get a curve which is crossing like this. The log p log is crossing. The moment it crosses, you know there is an error in the facing. That is something has been wrongly assigned. Or you may get an error which is which is where the line is not straight and it is bulging like this at the center. It is, it is instead of going straight, it is bulging. So one line is like this, the next one is like this, like this, it keeps on bulging with error. So if you have a bulge like this, then you know again there is a facing error. So this would be immediately telling you about facing errors. These are all actual diagrams which have, where I introduced the error and plotted. Then you could have referencing errors. That means where the pressure value is not properly given. You gave a wrong value. And referencing errors are not seen at high pressures, they are seen at low pressures. Uh, if I have a cylinder pressure diagram, and this is, let us say, 100 bar, and this is, let us say, 1 bar. If I do an error in assigning the right pressure, the error will be felt more at 1 bar than at 100 bar. Because the a 0.1 uh, bar error over 100 bar is small. The 0.1 bar error over 10, 1 bar is very high. So you will find that if you have errors in referencing, the curve becomes curved at low pressures. The curve is not curved at, the, the line is not curved at low pressure, high pressures, the line is curved at low pressures. So the referencing error starts dominating at low pressures. You can see it here. On the other hand, you give an error in clearance volume. That is, I have wrongly assigned compression ratio. I didn't put the clearance volume properly. Where is the volume minimum? Near top dead center. And any error in volume will dominate near top dead center. So you find that the curve is, the, the line is bending near top dead center. Below that it is straight. So by looking at this, you can know that something has happened near top dead center. And what can happen near top dead center will be volume rather than pressure. Because pressure is very high, volume is very small. Here what has happened is, at low pressure, so what can affect is pressure rather than volume because volume here is very large. Pressure only is low. So like this, by looking at the cylinder pressure curve, it will be possible for you to sort of find out what was the error. The next error, uh, next thing which I have told you but I did not go further is the facing. So determination of top dead center. So in an engine, you would first of all exactly determine top dead center and put the angle encoder in such a way that the pulse coming from the top, from the angle encoder which is voltage versus time, exactly raises at TDC. So first of all, the engine must be physically put at TDC, angle encoder must be adjusted so that exactly at TDC it gives me this pulse. Then the system will recognize. So there are many methods of exactly determining TDC. And uh, there is also what is called as a thermodynamic method with many software will use. That is, you simply run the engine and switch off the engine. But the engine is simply cranking and stopping. Where do you think the peak will occur in a motored engine? Not firing, simply motoring. I am talking about an engine which is cranked and uh, there is no combustion. Pressure will raise and then it will fall. So you will simply have a pressure curve which will go up and go down. This is time, this is pressure. And where do you think this, this thing will occur? Will it occur at top dead center? where the volume is minimum, we will think it will occur at top dead center because volume is minimum, pressure will be maximum. But what really happens is this occurs slightly before top dead center. The pressure maximum actually occurs slightly before top dead center and this how much slightly would be something like some 0 0.7 to about 1.2 degree crank angle. In that range it will occur. 
The reason for this, again I will not go into great details, is mainly heat transfer and leakage through the piston. And this is what it will, uh, this is what you will get. So if you have a pressure curve where your peak during motoring is occurring somewhere there, then you can be sure that your pressure curve is okay, facing is okay. If it is not occurring there, then facing is not okay. So this is also a check for seeing whether your pressure has been properly faced. So like this, there are several <coughs> ways of doing it, but this is one of the ways which many software will do. Next, I will move on to the calculation of heat release rates. Now, you know, you now have pressure. You now basically have pressure versus theta. From there, you can get pressure versus theta and, you know, sorry, pressure versus volume. So this, this is this is what you have and this is what you computed, pressure versus volume. And from pressure versus volume, you can get work and so many other calculations. This is what we are going to see now. Now, we are trying to get the combustion. And what do we mean by combustion? The rate at which combustion is occurring, combustion rate. And how do we express combustion rate? In joules per second or joules per degree crank angle. That means combustion is releasing heat. It's a, it's a notional thing. Combustion is releasing heat at this rate. And we want to know at what rate it is releasing. And whenever heat release has started, we say it is start of combustion. Whenever heat release has stopped, we say it is end of combustion. Whenever 50% of the heat has been released, we say it is half of combustion. So we would like to know how combustion is proceeding. And to determine how combustion is proceeding, we are now going to extract the information from cylinder pressure. I'm going to tell you how this process can be. Now, for extracting combustion, first what we do some assumptions. We do some, because it is, it is hidden in pressure. As I told you, there are many effects which are hidden in pressure. We have to remove all the effects, then we can look at combustion. So we need to do some sort of modeling of different processes. So I'm just telling, trying to tell you a very simplified model. You have more complicated models, but this model also works very well. Now what we do is, we assume that combustion is occurring. We assume that combustion is occurring outside the cylinder. One minute, please. Let me. We assume that combustion is occurring outside the cylinder and heat is being transferred to the cylinder at the rate at which combustion is occurring. This is an assumption. That means the cylinder gases are, let us say, only air. The cylinder gases could be only air and combustion is occurring outside the cylinder. That means the flame is not burning inside, it's burning outside. It's an imagine, imagine everything. And then the amount of heat that the flame is transferring to your gas is being transferred from outside through a heat transfer. That's all, imaginary heat transfer. Why we do all this is to say that because of combustion, the gas in the cylinder does not change its composition. Because modeling composition is one step more difficult and it may not be required when you look at engine combustion. The first cut, first cut engine combustion that may not be required. So we are assuming combustion, assuming outside, heat being transferred and QC is the rate at which heat is being transferred and this is what we want to find as combustion rate, QC dot. But we know anyway from the engine there will be heat transfer, QH dot. There will be work output or power which is W dot. So all these things would anyway be occurring in the engine. So if we model all this, then we'll be able to get the influence of this alone. This is, a, this is the way. So how do we do this? We write the first law. It is a simple thing. We write the first law for the same old system. We say QC is going in, QH is going out. QC minus QH, Q should be equal to W plus the change in internal energy. So QC minus QH is del W plus du. And this is also, I would say, del. Hmm? OK, del QC minus del QH. So this is the equation. Now what we do is, we then change it as W as PDV and du as D of MCVT, U as MCVT. OK, so and then what we do is, this QC becomes a function of theta. The heat that is being released becomes a function of theta. The heat transfer becomes area 
heat transfer area multiplied by heat transfer coefficient multiplied by gas temperature minus wall temperature. That is the heat transfer that occurs from the gas to the wall. PdV remains PdV on the right hand side and this remains as it is. So this becomes the expression which you have to solve. Now what we want is this one. If we give values for all this then we can get this one. So it is a question of giving values for all this. The value for this we got from P theta and V theta from the experiment. Now the value of for this you need to get the value of Cv. Cv can be got from T gas and assuming that the gas is ideal, it is similar to air. So you may, may, may want to make assumptions here. After all that you will be able to get your Cv. Then T gas has to be estimated. T wall has to be estimated. Heat transfer coefficient has to be estimated. Area can be calculated from geometry. If you put all this then you can get QC. But you find that this is complicated in the real sense. Why? Because heat transfer coefficient can vary with position. Heat transfer coefficient vary with crank angle. Tg temperature of the gas is very difficult to estimate. Temperature of the wall also may be changed in different, may be different in different positions. The what the gas is, it is very difficult to model. So this equation, though is simple when it appears, when you actually put on the engine, you need to make many more assumptions to actually solve it. But you can solve it by running a computer simulation alongside and all that. But it may not be really required if you are quickly looking at combustion. So there is a way out of all this. What they do is, it's, it's an accepted practice, and it is done by many software, commercial software. This initially they remove this QH. They remove this QH. This term is gone. Then you have only this expression. And in this expression, when you apply ideal gas law, you can convert it to this. That is, you are saying Cp is R gamma by gamma minus one. Cv is R by gamma minus one. You replace all that, then this expression becomes simplified to this. No heat transfer. Then what you do is you bring in the effect of heat transfer by replacing this gamma by n. You are simply putting a value of n. And this n can be estimated, assume somewhere around 1.2 to 1.3, depending on the combustion process, depending on whether it is a diesel engine and all that. You can plug this value of n and then try to calculate Qc by del Qc by del theta, which is the heat release rate. So this is what is called as fast heat release. It is, it is approximate. One has to remember that this is approximate, but this is fast. It is quick. No, no big assumptions. So for a quick way of estimating heat release, this can be done. And this is done by many software. If you do that, then you may get from your cylinder pressure something like this. You can get on the right hand side, you get the heat release rate. This is a typical diesel engine heat release rate. So from pressure, you will be able to go to the heat release rate. From heat release rate, you can go to cumulative heat release. This is called this is heat release rate. So you can get both. So from pressure versus theta, you go to this one and then from this one you go to this one. And this tells you how combustion has occurred. At what rate is it? This is actually joules per degree crank angle. And this is joules. So you can see how combustion has really occurred from the actual engine. And as the engine is running, you can look at you can be looking at combustion. Suppose I take make a change in the injection timing or something like that, what happens? All these you can actually see. So this is uh, what we mean by cylinder pressure to its analysis to give heat release rate. As I told you, it's uh, we started from mounting the transducer, seeing what are the errors that can be associated, how we correct the pressure values from the transducer, how we make assumptions and finally get to combustion. So it is an involved process. It is as accurate as our analysis. It is as accurate as we estimate the pressure. So this, uh, there are a lot of software which do this. They do it reasonably well, no doubt about it. They do it well, very well. But if the user has to get extreme accuracies out of that, he should know what is actually happening. And he can always improve upon it. And all this can be easily done by our own software as well. We can even write the codes for all this. So with this, I would like to stop. 
at this point. I think it's time. Hmm? So we had gone somewhere. It's possible. So I quickly wound up again. Now I will just think of you. But I will not go back on this one. Yes, you can maybe this one you can always get it. Because we got a person also for one another. Yeah, because this one I will cut something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will go back. I just think. So, I will discuss otherwise some general points more. Yeah. Some general points more. So, if someone asks me a question or something, anything is okay. You can overall sum up something in 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. So there it looks like we have another half an hour. So um, I sort of tried to complete this by 3.30. So I, I skipped something, but uh, I don't think there's any point in going back on this. But if you have any questions, anyone from anywhere, uh, we can answer. Or I should pick up some other uh, thing which can, if I can show. Hello. Hello, yes. I am from YMCA Ministry of Science and Technology, Pradeepak. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, in uh, cylinder nowadays, the pressure is quite high. Yes. And uh, there, there may be chances of uh, leakage through piston or piston rings. Yes. So, uh, what improvements in the design of piston rings we are doing nowadays to avoid leakage? I, I, I don't think leakage is a big problem now. Uh, yes, you are very right in saying that uh, cylinder pressures have gone up significantly and they are likely to go up also further. But there has been a matching improvement in the ring material, in the ring structure, the way the ring cross, cross section and uh, the pressure that the ring exerts on the wall of the combustion, on the wall of the cylinder, uh, so that the pressure is very important because it it, it, it influences ceiling and it also influences wear. So all this, there have been lots of improvements. There have been improvements in coating on the rings, coatings on the ring, and uh, also in the basic uh, material with which the ring is made, basic material which is the cylinder is made, and all that. And these have meant that, uh, I don't think, they, I mean, they, they, these have seen to it that the leakages have not been a problem. In fact, the blow, blow by and all have come down significantly. The oil getting into the combustion chamber has also come down significantly. Otherwise, we will not be able to meet emission norms so easily. So, uh, my second question is: Yes. Uh, uh, in uh, inside the cylinder, the temperature is around twenty thousand. Not not twenty thousand. Two thousand, maybe maximum two thousand. Two thousand. Yes. And uh, we are putting a transducer. Uh, and the pressure rise up to uh, 500 degrees centigrade, as you were saying. Yes, yes, sometimes it can go, yes. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, is it vehicle is uh, going, uh, traveling a lot of distance. Mm. Uh, many times we have a long journey. Yes. So in that case, the uh, temperature uh, rise may be more, and transducer may melt it. Actually, uh, two things. One is these cylinder pressure transducers are not used in regular, not for regular applications. These are used only in the laboratory. Because these are pretty expensive. If you look at any transducer today, uh, only cylinder pressure transducer, without all the other things, the transducer could be close to one and a half to two and a half lakhs. So it is impossible to use it on a vehicle. And along with that, you have a charge amplifier, your data acquisition, your angle encoder, manifold pressure. So it is not a system. Whatever we have discussed now, it is not, not a system which will be used in the vehicle. But people are looking at using cylinder pressure transducer in the vehicle. That's a different thing. So. That apart, uh, coming back to the real problem, the engine combustion temperature can go up to about 2000 degrees centigrade, but it is for a very short time. Only when combustion is occurring and it is at, and the pressure at it is at its maximum. Afterwards, the temperature falls. That is why even though the gas can go up to such high temperatures, the cylinder pressure transducer surface sometimes can go only up to about 500 degrees Celsius. But the crystal within, within the cylinder pressure transducer may not go even to this 500 because it is behind this. And there are a lot of precautions taken to see that that doesn't go up to these temperatures. So the point to note is that these temperatures are not always reached. 
and these temperatures can be managed with the present present kind of transducers. Secondly, these temperatures are not limited to the time of operation. It may occur even if the time of operation is very short, but your load is very high. So because you may be burning a lot of fuel and the temperature can go up and go down. So that is how it is. And uh, one more thing is that it is not for regular use. It is only for laboratory use. Look Thank at commercial. You, Thank you. What will be the total cost of this setup? The total cost of this setup, uh, I, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I cannot give you commercial because I am not competent to give and we are also buying. I know only the cost at which we normally buy. So as I told you, the transducer could be anywhere between the kind of transducer which you buy could be anywhere between one and a half to two lakhs. Of course, in the uh, it is what the companies offer, and uh, the then you have a charge amplifier which could also be expensive, maybe something like I, I guess it would be something like fifty thousand to one lakh. Then you have an angle encoder, and there are different kinds of angle encoders available, and they range from even say twenty thousand or 15,000 to 3 lakhs. So if if the user is competent and if the user has a feel for things, you can work with this 20,000 angle encoder itself. If the user is just going to take it and plug it and just wants to work, then he naturally goes for a very costly trans um, angle encoder. So if you are comfortable with electronics and instrumentation, then you could go in for devices which are less expensive and use them with the same accuracy. I don't say accuracy will suffer because you know how to use them so you can do use it better. So the angle encoder could be something like 20,000 to even 2 or 3 lakhs. The sensor would be about 1.5 to 2.5 lakhs. The charge amplifier around 1 lakh and then the, uh, the manifold pressure transducer could be around 50,000 to 1 lakh. Then you have your data acquisition system and data acquisition system depends again on what you want to do. For example, in our lab we normally, at least our research students, have never been buying this data acquisition system. We have always written our own software to acquire data and process and do all these C lease calculations. And then we only buy a, a data acquisition board and fix it onto the lab, on the, fix it onto the computer. The data acquisition board will come for about 50,000 rupees. So you plug it into your computer, write your own software, you get a data acquisition system which is now worth maybe 10 or 20 lakhs and you can use it and the software is yours and you know what it is exactly doing. So this is one way. I think uh, as academics we should look at writing our own software because we understand what is happening and this is not too difficult to do in my opinion. Whereas in the industry they don't have time and uh, users are many. One user will may, uh, use tomorrow, someone will use. So they want to go to very modular and well, uh, what do you say, well structured things and they go in for uh, ready-made software. But academicians can always develop. And through development, we can learn, learn more. And uh, so to give a final answer to what you wanted, the cylinder pressure measuring system on the whole could be anywhere from 5 lakhs to maybe 20, 25 lakhs, whatever, depending on what all we buy along with that. What is the purpose of making heat damps on piston crowns? Heat damps. Sir, what is the purpose of making heat damps on piston crown? I don't understand what you mean by heat damps. If I, if I, I'm just only guessing. Are you looking at those uh, sort of rings that I mean grooves that are cut? Sir, the question is right, written right here. What is the purpose of making? Yeah, somebody has typed in the question. Oh, you have typed the question. Somebody has typed. The okay. If I, if I, if I guess, uh, it is those kinds of grooves that you make. And then it is simply to see that you don't transfer heat to the skirt of the piston. That means you create a sort of a restriction to the flow of heat by reducing the heat transfer area, cross-sectional area. So conduction reduces. So your uh, base of the piston or the skirt of the piston doesn't get heated significantly. And you transfer the heat directly from the crown to the wall of the cylinder. That's what I guess. Sir, is there any software for testing the performance of engine? Performance of the engine. <laughs> Yes. See, testing the performance of the engine means we need to actually see. One is you simulate the engine, and for simulation, there are software which are commercially available, or you could yourself develop a software. That is one. But that is not testing the real engine. But if you want to test the real engine, then you have to run the real engine on a dynamometer test bed and then measure its fuel consumption, output, emissions, etc. 
and there are software which will help you in doing all these calculations, but the engine experiment anyway has to be done. So it is uh, not only by software, you need to run an engine, get measured values and then maybe put it in a software, then it can plot all the graphs and give you, but which you can also do on your own even in Excel. Otherwise you simulate the engine and then in that case you are not running the engine at all, but then uh, the simulation is as good as your, the assumptions that you make and uh, so you need to again check with experiments. So I don't think there is any software which can directly give the performance. Hello. Yes, sir. I am calling from Hawaii University. Yes, please. Yes, sir. My question is related to cylinder pressure. Yeah. I mean, uh, on the basis of cylinder pressure, could be uh, just the life cycle engine. I mean, uh, the day we have started using a car. Yes. And after the usage of application of six years, hmm. uh, could be just that uh, it's better to uh, go for a new car, or it's better to uh, further we can use this engine. Pressure. Definitely it is possible to estimate the the uh, the condition of the engine from cylinder pressure, but I feel that it is too sophisticated a tool to use for that because it is too expensive a tool and too fine a tool to just use for determining whether the engine is okay or not, but definitely it can give you because it can give you much more information than any other, any one sensor which you can use because cylinder pressure can tell you about the leakages in the engine. Leakages are a result of piston rings, and wear in the liner, wear, I mean leaky valves, so many things it can tell you. It can tell you about combustion and combustion can tell you about the fuel injection system and things like that. So it can also tell you from IMEP and BMEP, you know friction. It can also tell you whether you have problems with friction. So, so many things can be got from cylinder pressure, but it is too expensive a tool to be used for this application. But it is not, uh, these days are not far because people are looking at making cheaper pressure sensors and then one day maybe it will come and even now it is used on very very expensive engines. If you have a very big uh, let us say uh, genset engine, the engine itself costs uh, let us say a few crores or even maybe tens of crores, then it may not be a problem to put a cylinder pressure transducer and keep measuring the cylinder pressure all the time to look at the life of the engine. It is being done. It depends on, but in an automotive engine, the engine itself would be some 2 or 3 lakhs and then uh, transducer would be equally expensive or even more expensive, so it doesn't make sense at the moment. Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, are there any major encounter drifting transducers? Any major? Encounter drifting transducers. Yes, yes, yes. Drifting transducers, you can, we, exp I mean, uh, my personal experience with our students. Uh, we, they have, my, our students have experienced drift very often. In fact, drift is very difficult to, the drift because of unclean transducer or unclean wires is very common and uh, it is very difficult to eliminate also. And uh, if you, if you maintain the entire transducer very clean and neat, then you can avoid drift. Otherwise, drift comes and it takes quite a bit of time to correct it. Thank you, sir. I think there is no more questions. You can otherwise interact with Any other thing you would like to know? <laughs> I and uh, these are the yeah. teachers. Yeah. And uh, I also want to uh, uh, maybe use this opportunity to tell something. Uh, as you all know, uh, you have what is called as QIP, the Quality Improvement Program, and uh, there are many IITs, NITs, many uh, other engineering colleges which are QIP institutions. In fact, uh, all, all the IITs are QIP institutions and I think all the NITs are also QIP institutions. So I would uh, definitely uh, wish that those of you who are trying to pursue your masters or doctorates, please make use of this QIP because then you can go to good institutions and do your doctorates and then you can um, academically it will be very good and uh, very fruitful for you. So please consider going for QIP and uh, even if you have done your PhDs, please encourage your friends who are in academ academics to uh, make use of this opportunity. The, the government is spending a lot of money and um, making available this QIP opportunity, so please do make use of this. 
and I would like to appeal to all of you. So there are a few more questions. One is that uh, uh, is the combination of fours to four stroke and two stroke engine possible with EGR? Combination of four stroke and two stroke engines. Actually, there are some engines which uh, can work as four stroke and as two stroke. We, I'm sure you would have also read it. It is there. Uh, there are some. Uh, inf there's some information available in the net as well. But these engines are not mainly based on EGR, but they are uh, based on how the valve timing is sequenced. So with valve timing, they try to play with the valve timing and run the same engine in a two-stroke mode and in a four-stroke mode when required. But I don't still see any commercially available engines because uh, I don't really. Some people say that when you want higher power outputs, you run like a two-stroke engine and so on. But I don't see it commercially coming. There's another question. Uh, what are the new research areas in this field? Any specific you would like to share? Okay. <clears throat> uh, the new areas in this field. Uh, one is if you are looking at. Uh, I would like to say what what we are what is happening now. See, one of the important things that is happening uh, is that there is a lot of electronic controls and things like that getting into engines. Now, as uh, Professor would also know, in robotics, now uh, in engines also it has almost become like that. And uh, and without the ECU there is no engine which runs. And so when you, when you do research, it now becomes very important for you to know how these electronic controllers work and what they can do for you. We don't have to make an electronic controller, but we should be able to use an electronic controller very well or tell an electronics person what we want exactly. Because ultimately, it's doing something which a mechanical engineer wants. And so the right information is given only by the mechanical engineer. So I, I want to first impress upon you that it is important for us to really go a bit deep into instrumentation and uh, the digital electronics, which we have already done at our undergraduate level. That is enough. I don't think we need to do anything new. If we are, if we are confident of that, I think we can do a lot better in what we want to do in engines. That is one. The second thing is, once we know that, there's a lot of opportunity, opportunity to work with engine management because now engine management is a very, very important thing. So uh, you want to manage every every aspect of the engine. You want to manage how the fuel injection system has to work or how the turbocharger has to work or how the uh, cooling system has to work and uh, how the injection has to be scheduled and things like that in any engine. And uh, to if you want to do that, you may want to make a model of the engine, then study how the engine performs and then try to have a model of the controller, link it to this, and then try to run and see which is the best way an engine has to be operated. And this is a good area for research. And for doing that, you should be comfortable with engine modeling, that is thermodynamics engine modeling and things like that, and also be comfortable with a little bit of electronics and software. And software means writing codes. And this is something which would be very useful. I'm sure I, I wish to also tell this, that everyone should venture into this. In future, it is important. So. Uh, we should not think that we are mechanical engineers and electronics is difficult. I am sure it is not difficult. You have to get into that. Then we can do a lot. That is one. Secondly, looking at other areas of engines itself, hardcore IC engines, uh, you know that one of the areas is homogeneous charge compression ignition, HCCI. And HCCI is it's a research area. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it is an area of where people are trying to commercialize. All over the world, people are working on this homogeneous charge compression ignition to, to see to it that it can be practically implemented or it can have some practical applications. So for, as far as research is concerned, this is a very good area to work, to work on alternate fuels with HCCI or engine control with HCCI and things like that. The next one is to work on uh, GDI, gasoline direct injection. This is also a new thing which has come. And uh, new thing means it is, it is it is not a very new concept. The concept was known, but again, it has become popular because of electronic controls. So there are there are there are lots which can be done in this. Bringing out low cost electronic fuel injection systems, bringing out low cost common rail systems. These are all the need of the day. And if one can CRDI, CRDI, but low cost, low. low cost, something which can be lower, and the low cost can come by uh, making hardware which is simpler, I mean mechanical hardware which is simpler or making an electronic control which is simpler or writing your own software which is which is simpler or eliminating some sensors so you can there is a wide opportunity but one has to venture into that area now and that area is open if mechanical engineers learn electronics and get into that i think you can perform 
very well and it is not too difficult in our lab we do lot of work like that many students are very very good in all this and they are all electron mechanical students who are doing working with all this but they picked it up naturally and doing very well so it is not very difficult so i think uh, it's a good area to venture at this point <coughs> So I would like to uh, share, as Sir said, that uh, because as mechanical engineers nowadays, whether you are in the field of IC engines, uh, manufacturing, automation, any other field, we have to make use of sensors and instrumentation and controllers. And we, because we don't have to design those systems, we should have the knowledge of the availability of different type of sensors, where they can be used, how they can be used, how can we use the controllers. So I think that knowledge is sufficient for mechanical engineers and it is not difficult to acquire it. So as an example, I always say to my students that uh, in my course on automation, I always start them by introducing them to PLCs and teaching them programming and they are able to pick it up within a week because these things are not difficult so once you venture into it they come to you another thing is that because in mechanical engineering we are always uh, uh, thinking at a uh, physical level right not at a microscopic level like in electronics or otherwise so maybe we are able to visualize things better than people who are from electronics or electrical. And the best <laughs> yeah. software that is required for mechanical engineers can be written only by mechanical engineers. <laughs> yes, yes. Because yes. all others can write by your telling them what, yeah, you want. what you want. But if you if you yourself can do it, you can do it at the uh, best possible way. And all you require for writing software is essentially the ability to develop a logic and implement it. And mechanical engineers are actually, they I think, introduced logic b much before in uh, electronics yes. came. You see all the mechanical machines which are purely mechanical like governors or for that matter uh, pneumatic sensors and all these things, yes. right? even uh, the fluidics. fluidics. So uh, even uh, going into uh, logic and digital logic is not difficult, one should do it. So I think today we have a very, very uh, rare opportunity that Professor A. Ramesh is here from IIT Chennai and uh, some of you who may not be aware, he is a very well known personality in the field of automobile engineering. So I think if you have a few more questions, you can share your questions and get new ideas from sir. Because